Hello to our friends watching us on Facebook Live. They, thanks for joining us on our Sunday Supper Podcast video stream. If you have any questions, any declarations, and any shout outs, please leave those in the comments and we will try to get to those at the end of the show. Our show today is brought to you by Kohler. At Kohler, you'll find the Whitehaven Apron Front Sink, which features a large single basin that accommodates large pots and pans, while the sloped bottom helps with draining and cleanup. Crafted from enameled cast iron, this sink resists chipping, cracking, or burning for years of beauty and reliable performance. Welcome to Sunday Supper. Yes, welcome yes. to Sunday <laughs> Supper. Welcome Yay. to Sunday Supper. We're here. We're here. I was not here last week. I'm happy to be back. You're here. Yay. You're here again. We love to have <laughs> Ashley here because we're kind of afraid of what happens when Ashley's not here and doing things. I'm your host, Mike Jordan. We know that this is Ashley Twist Cole. That is Kate Williams, correct? Hi. Yes. yes. And uh, <laughs> you all are joining us for our Virginia Willis Y'all episode. <laughs> y'all. You will never forget who's here on the Virginia Willis. Uh, you'll never you'll never think who we have. Who do we have? <laughs> there you go. It's me. It's Virginia Willis. I'm glad to be y'all. here. Y'all. Yes, y'all. Absolutely. Award-winning chef, cookbook author, Southern Food Authority. She's here today to talk to us about her new book, Secrets of the Southern Table. Very Vanna beautiful. White, this. It is lovely. <laughs> yes, a food lover's tour of the global south. Get it right. And she's going to share some valuable cooking and recipe development secrets for some of you home chefs out there. And we're going to talk about all kind of other stuff, y'all. We're going to say y'all. <laughs> y'all. Yes, stuff we are. Yeah. Stuff yes, y'all. we are. That's my Folks next book. who don't know the y'all of Virginia Willis, you know, y'all out there who don't know her, let's talk about your background and how you became the person that you are that can put out these amazing books and just do so many wonderful things in the kitchen to help people. Well, gosh, thank you so much. No um, pressure. No pressure. No pressure. Um, I've been cooking since I was a little girl. There are pictures of me making biscuits with my grandmother when I was three years old, and that's you know not not made up. Yep. Um, I've always loved to cook. Um, my mom is a great cook. Hey, mama. Hey, mama. Um, <laughs> she's watching. Um, my mother's a great cook. You know, I was the the kid that was taking like leftover crepe champignon and roulade poulet and all this to school. Mm. You know, when you're a kid, when you, like, when you, say what? What? <laughs> you know, I wanted like a bologna sandwich, but yeah. uh, no, it's okay. It's all good. Um, so, and I also grew up in Louisiana, so I was exposed to jambalaya and etouffee and all those classic Creole dishes. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've just always loved to cook. And, and then the, the key, what sort of twisted it into me becoming a professional, was my first job cooking um, was as an apprentice with Natalie Dupree, who of course used to live here in Atlanta, and mm-hmm. one is, of Mike's favorite books. And, uh, yeah, I love Natalie Dupree's <laughs> you know, biscuit book. And yeah. she's so wonderful too. She's yes. she's awesome. Yeah. She's a dear friend and mentor. And um, I went to her and apprenticed on one of her TV shows for a short period of time, and then afterwards asked if I could come and apprentice with her. So I worked with her for a year, um, and learned and. The way I like to describe it is Natalie took me sort of out of my mom's kitchen and Uh it started exposing me to classic French cooking and Mm -hmm. how to make it and uh, and then it just went on from there. Was it, I have to ask, was it an easy sell to get her to uh, kind of mentor you or did she take a little convincing or was kind of like, you know, come back next week kid kind of thing? (laughs) No, I mean, no, she, I'm a hard worker, right? I mean, I'm I'm proud of being a hard worker and uh, I was, I felt like I had, won the jackpot, yeah. you know, getting to go and work for free, whatever. I was getting this amazing education mm-hmm. um, and and washing a lot of dishes, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of dishes. That's and like so, the Mr. Miyagi, yeah, that's right. like, yeah. That's right. <laughs> cooking that's right. analogy. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's uh, yeah. So, um, you know, so if, if you do, if you show up and you do a good job, you get to come back, yeah. uh, right? I mean, that's pretty much with anything. That's great. Hopefully, yeah. 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 And you have won a James Beard Award. I, I, yes. What'd you yeah. say? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, <laughs> a James Beard I'm too, Award. Yeah, no, no. Say it as many times as you can. At the Beard Awards, yeah. Um, no, I'm, I'm very proud of that. And, of course, that's um, it's recognition by one's peers. And yeah. so I think that that's one of – and I mean, I've, I've won other awards. I've been nominated for other awards. But – but that was um, that was a life changer, right? Because mm-hmm. I mean, I realized that, like, in my obituary, eventually, hopefully, a long, <laughs> long time from now, <laughs> it's gonna off. no, not yet. It's gonna say Virginia Willis, comma, you know. Blah, I was gonna blah, say blah. It's, it's like getting a like a doctorate or an advanced yeah. degree. You always get to have that yeah. associated yeah. with your name. Yeah. So no, so I'm, I'm I'm obviously really really proud of that. I feel like uh, Virginia will also like call the editor and make sure that they have that even <laughs> from beyond. Out. Like make sure that y'all had I read it and it wasn't exactly right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like, no, no, no. <laughs> and so, how many cookbooks do you have, or books have you published? Uh, so I have three y'all books. So Bon Appetit mm -hmm. y'all, Basic to Brilliant y'all, and then Lighten Up y'all. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote a little book about okra. Mm -hmm. Okra, the green vegetable, not the media mogul. Yes. And people always think I'm saying <laughs> oh. they're like, did you get to meet her? I'm like, and then I realized what they were talking about. No, unfortunately, no book about Oprah yet. I thought you were um, going to correct people who say Accra, because uh, we do no. know people uh, yeah, who yeah, have yeah, said yeah, Accra yeah, yeah. before. No, no, no. Okay. Um, so I wrote a little, bit about, a little bit about Okra for UNC Press, um, and one of their Savor the South series, mm -hmm. that beautiful mm -hmm. series that they do. And then a book about grits mm -hmm. for short stack editions. So yep. that, um, th those are my primary books. Yeah, those I think books. I have all of those. I yeah. know you've got okra you. on your Thank desk. You. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. 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 And they're excellent. And they're all very well. I, I'm. A, I look at everything from the design and the photography and everything there, but the stories are there too. So I think that was one of the things that made me really it really helped me to get into your book was the story aspect and that's what works. Well it's kind of interesting because I'm a cook that became a writer you know I mean I worked yeah. in kitchens and a lot of people don't realize I've worked in restaurant kitchens but I have I worked in restaurants when I was putting myself through culinary school, I worked in uh, restaurants when I was in college um, worked in restaurants in France, uh, you know Michelin starred restaurants in France and so um, I but at, at, at the same time, starting off with Natalie, I kind of realized that, I mean, there's that, there's so many jobs in the culinary field yes. other than working a line in a restaurant right. or being an executive chef. So from the beginning, it was more about the media aspect of it, you know, the cookbooks and magazines and TV shows and things like that. Um, but eventually what happened was that, uh, you know, I was writing recipes and testing recipes for other people. Um, and when I was with Martha Stewart, I was like, I want to write a book. And so it just, you know, I really, that's where Bon Appetit Y'all came from, is just that and wanting to share those stories about growing up in the South. Yeah. I mean, so how do you even decide when you say I'm going to write a book, you know, it's, you're saying it from a writer perspective mm -hmm. as well. So did you look at other people's writing and kind of like folks that you think, or did you just come from within and say, I'm just going to lay out my story? How did you get to the point to where you could put your story out in the uh, cookbook? So Bon Appetit offers is three res recipes and stories from three generations. So I wanted to tell my story about growing up in Louisiana and Georgia, talk about my mama's food and my grandmother's food. And that was very, my books are hugely personal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're really personal, and I don't know any other way to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I'm not being disparaging at all, but, you know, like now, especially with restaurant chefs, you know, they have a team of writers, a team of this, a team of that. If it's in my book, I tested it. Mm -hmm. If it's in my book, I tested it again. Wow. <laughs> if it's in my book, if it's not in my book, it's because I didn't like it. Okay. You know what I mean? And so, and I did the food styling, and it's just, it's a sort of a, it's like an extension, it's, it's what I do. Yeah. So, um, so it also is sort of an organic process, right? Like, so Bon Appetit, y'all, was very personal, me, me growing up. Basic to Brilliant was, oh, you know what? I went to French culinary school. Let's show off some of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that book didn't do so well. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Stick to Okra, Virginia. Um, and then Lighten Up, y'all, was a, was, a, a, was a result of two things. Part of it was a, a personal reason. I'd gotten off track with my health and, and, um, and also, I got tired of people telling me that Southern food was unhealthy. Right. I love that book. That's, Thank you. I think that's my favorite yeah, book. Yeah, I mean, it, it was. It, it does, you know, we, we talk about that sort of myth all yeah. the time, right? Yeah, of course, if you eat fried chicken every single day of your life. Like, yeah, and, and I've never had bacon wrapped deep fat fried macaroni and cheese in my <laughs> right. life. Yeah. I mean, what is that? That is not real food. That's right. like someone made that up in a TV studio. That's state fair food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so, you know, and th that was an evolution. And uh, okra, as an aside, okra and uh, grits were like sort of pet pro pet projects. Okay. Um, but this book, Secrets of the Southern Table, yes. it's once again, it's like just digging a little bit deeper. Part of it is that, that perception that people have about Southern food, mm -hmm. and then the stories about the people, it's the perception that people have about Southerners. Mm -hmm. ah. so th and this book is a little bit different. Can you kind yeah. of give the 30 second pitch yeah, of this so book? Yeah, so I have recipes all tested that I did as well, of course, um, but each chapter has two stories about a farmer, an artisan, a maker, um, that sort of fleshes it out, and it was very intentional to choose different Races, ages, and genders. 
Very nice. Mm -hmm. Very nice. And um, what are some of the things that you think people are going to discover from making that type of decision and, bear, and being very deliberate in doing it? What do you think is going to show folks when they read? Well, I think that, you know, when we, when we sit at the table together, is when people, it, it's a, it's a, it's to have this dialogue. Yes. Um, it's when people from different cultures can come together. Mm -hmm. And we often come together, at the t you know, we can come together at the table. So someone may not know, say, um, a, 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 a uh, African American or Spanish American, Hispanic American, but if they read that story and they read about Laura Ramirez, or if they read that story and they read about Matthew Rayford, or they read about these different people and kind of get what where they are mm -hmm. um, and eat their food, I just I'm hoping that people just get to know one another and people be nicer to each other. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I know that, that sounds so Pollyanna, <laughs> but I, I wanted to show the diversity of the South. Well, I don't want this to sound racist, but some of my best friends are African Americans. So, you know, I mean, that's just. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it, race is a big thing in Southern food. Race is a yeah. big thing in um, in the South, and you know, I write about it in the in the introduction that there's there's not clear lines of ownership. I mean, we mm -hmm. have a tremendous amount of of what's in Southern food that uh, was uh, brought from Africa. There's a tremendous influence, of course, from the from the enslaved Africans that farm the food, and then for many years, the enslaved Africans that cook the food. Mm -hmm. We can't get away from that. And if you try, in my opinion, you're doing a disservice to everyone. I agree. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But now, uh, you know, there's there, who's cooking the food now? It's Mexican Americans, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's like, so there's, it, it's not a hugely political book. It's not that, but what, I, I just want people to get to know other people. I think that's no. really important. Um, I was at a seminar and one of the things that stuck with me, it was just this really amazing woman speaking and she said, one thing that I encourage you all to do is sit down and have a coffee or have a meal with somebody who doesn't look like you. Yep. Whether that is age, race, right. gender, whatever. And yeah. I just, you know, one of the things we try to do at Southern Kitchen is talk about all of the people in the South right. and really try to represent what it really is because there's a lot of cliches. No, for sure. I mean, I travel a lot for my work and also I live part-time in Massachusetts and, you know, so I get a lot of, well, I love Southern food, but it's so unhealthy, so there's mm -hmm. that. And then also, um, you know, they just, the, the South, I think, is misunderstood. I would agree. And um, I think that it does take folks who are making these types of attempts to bring folks together over the fact that there is food on the table and everyone can agree on that right. usually. Or even if they can't, it does forward or foster a conversation. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Well, we just want to take a very quick moment to remind you of our sponsor, which is Kohler. At Kohler, you will discover reimagined, innovative finds like the new Farmstead enameled cast iron freestanding kitchen sink. It can be installed wall mount with legs or top mount with custom cabinetry, giving it the look of a unique hand constructed piece of furniture. So, Virginia, we wanted to kind of go into the part of cookbooks with you uh -huh. that I think sometimes, and Kate, you know a little bit about mm -hmm. this as well, recipe development. And, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of people who, I mean, in my family or just around, period, you hear folks say they'd love to write a cookbook mm -hmm. or they like these cookbooks, they like these others, but you were talking about recipe testing and how mm -hmm. important that is. Mm -hmm. So let's kind of talk about how you go about putting recipes together uh -huh. into a book and that whole process, if you can help us out. Meanwhile, with that. I'm going to flip through and look for the specific recipe Sorbonne that I want you to talk about. Okay, okay. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. So I keep a notebook in the kitchen, and if I'm sort of just playing around and making supper, then I'll write, I'll take some notes. Okay. Or like when, with my work with Kate, for example, with Cooking for Virginia, like we have, we've predetermined what things are going to be about. We just wrote this piece about Vidalia onions. We're yes. going to together because it's Vidalia onion season. Time. So when there's editorial direction, there's one thing, but if it's just me sort of creating and coming up with things that will eventually be in a book or on my blog or whatever, um, I, I keep a notebook and if I'm doing something that I like, I'll take a note and then of course I use my iPhone for like everything. Okay. Right? Mike doesn't do that because he doesn't have an <laughs> iPhone. <laughs> I have a hundred dollar limit on that kind of thing. I'll buy a fifty dollar bag of gummy bears, but I won't spend more than a hundred dollars on fun. A hundred? Yeah. You, you don't even have a tenth of an iPhone. If I had these gummy bears, I mean, bears, you wouldn't you would even understand. have like, yeah, yeah. I, I, we I, love him because he's quirky. Yeah, yeah. Um, wow. Okay, so I use my phone, and what I'll do is like I'll take a picture of it, and then I'll use the. There's this d tool on these phones oh. where you can oh. like smart. make notes. They're smartphones. They're like the internet's there and everything. Oh. <laughs> um, so I'll just kind of keep notes, and then. Um, 
And then when I'm planning a cookbook, for example, the idea of the overall book gels, and then what I try to do is like decide, um, frankly, that there needs to be a certain number of dishes that cover the seasons, right? Mm -hmm. So I need to have spring produce and vegetables, summer, fall, winter. So I look at it because it, what good is it going to if you buy this book and like, wow, all these vegetables are this, this is all for summer, mm -hmm. right? Because right? I want to encourage people to cook seasonally. Right. Okay. It tastes better and it's most often more, less expensive. Yep. Absolutely. Um, my recipes, I, I try really hard to, to create recipes that people are going to want to do. You know, I can chef it up and put food on with tweezers and stuff like that. But, <laughs> you know, uh, and I do sometimes when I do, you know, fancy dinners, sure. right? But when you get home from, when someone gets home from work mm -hmm. and they've been at work all day and they've got a kid or they've got to, to take to soccer practice or whatever, you know, um, I want to, I try to create recipes that people will do that have accessible ingredients and um, not too crazy the technique. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, or not too crazy a... Um, you know, not anything too involved. And I just try to encourage people that to understand that, you know, uh, you don't have to open a can or open a box. A lot of times those aren't actually really any faster. Right. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and they're packed with this, that, and the other things you can't pronounce. Mm -hmm. um, and so just like using good ingredients and doing as little to them as possible, not to mess them up. Yeah. That's kind yeah. of my philosophy with yeah. food. Very Love cool. Yeah. By the way, we just want to remind everybody that uh, you can use the code MOM20, that's M-O-M-2-0. It's a promo code. It'll get you 20% off uh, site-wide at Southern Kitchen. And that includes pre-ordering uh, Virginia Willis's book, Secrets, Secrets of, of the, the Southern, Southern Tables. Table. Mm -hmm. So go ahead and pick up your pre-ordered copy right now, and it'll make its way to your home address. May 1st is when mm -hmm. the book officially launches, so mm -hmm. just a couple of days. Yep, so exactly. Get your pre -order pre -order Mother's Day's coming. That's right. All right. So um, go ahead, Kate. I was going to say the, the, the notebook in the kitchen thing is something that I discovered, like, way too late. Because, I mean, my background is in recipe development. Right. And I spent a lot of time doing that in an office and in an office kitchen. And we come home and, like, just throw something together and not really pay attention mm -hmm. to what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And so, like, had a very strong identity about the cook food I was cooking at work, but not really right. at home. And it took a long time to, like, get back to cooking for myself and, like, playing around and doing stuff that was fun. And now I keep a notebook in my kitchen, too, and write. And it has to be, for me, it has to be, like, a piece of paper like an, it, my phone it doesn't it doesn't right. take yeah. no, it it's something I lose track of things on my no, phone no, a little sure, bit sure, more. Sure. sometimes it, the pictures help but like having a writ handwritten thing it's usually in scribble scrabble and nobody else can read it but like it's there it's yeah. written down somewhere and I can remember it and go back to it again another time and I think that's a good idea for people like even just like lay lay persons mm -hmm. right you know um I mean there's some people are religious about following a recipe um some people are not right but if you're if, if you have a little bit more freedom in the mm -hmm. kitchen, like we're professionals, right? But if someone's not a professional and they do something, if they can just write it down, mm -hmm. then it, 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 that's how yeah. recipes start. Yeah, like remembering how you make a tomato sauce for your pasta or something, right. like a salad even. Like right. writing down what you put in it and if you really like it, come back and do it again. Right, right. It's just mm -hmm. the documentation, sure. Yeah. But when you're getting those recipes kind of even started, so you're taking notes and you're mm -hmm. kind of doing a little bit of trial and error, um, of course. So well, how does yeah, that work? Well, I, so my, um, my background in recipe uh, development is that the recipe has to be completely written first before it's actually tested. Okay. So if, like, for example, with the onion dip, what I do is I write it up, um, sort of have a decision like what it's going to be, and then I test it and then make adjustments in it. And I find that that creates a more reliable recipe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, writing what you're doing as you're doing it, typing it up afterwards and taking a photograph of it, <laughs> that's actually not recipe testing. It's a lot of work. No. You know what I mean? It's, it's not. I know. It you doesn't know? sound it's, like it. It's not. It's like, it's like you have to really, so I like write down two onions, da 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 da, -da you know, each thing. And then when I go to make it and I've finished it, it's like, wow, you know what? This needs one more of this or one more of that. Um, it's just a, a, it's a pretty strict way of recipe testing. And um, there are a lot of folks that write cookbooks that sort of crowdsource recipe mm -hmm. testing, mm -hmm. which I'm not opposed to, mm -hmm. uh, but I always want to be part of that crowd. Yeah, that makes sense. You know? So recipes, I think, you know, there's a ton of them. And there's right. a ton of cookbooks and a ton of cookbook writers, how does the inception of a recipe start? So I'm looking at this Nashville hot grilled chicken, uh -huh. and as I was flipping through the book, this stood out to me because obviously Nashville hot chicken right. is super popular, and everybody's got a recipe. We've got a recipe. You've got a recipe. 
But I actually, and it could just be me not exploring the internet enough, but um, I haven't seen a grilled version. So can you talk about Yeah, kind of thank you for that, noticing that. Yeah. No, so Nashville hot grilled chicken is super popular, but how many, a lot of people don't fry chicken, right? Right. Yeah. right. In the home. I don't fry chicken often in the home. And once, you know, I'm, in, I'm a professional and can do it and love it. There's two reasons I don't do it. It's time consuming, it's messy, um, and we can't eat fried chicken every day. <laughs> you know? Darn. Until like the Let universe. The devil in your it's, house. And yeah, never I mean, right. you just you can't do that. So, um, and, and part of that came from a practical application and then also just making that little bit of a twist for something that I thought that people would actually do, mm -hmm. right? They would actually do it in their home. And grilling I, chicken is pretty low, yeah, low barrier to yeah, entry. Most yeah. people and then have the, done it. Yeah, and then the other piece of it was is just going back to what I just keep trying to share is that all Southern food doesn't have to be unhealthy, right? right? right. So chicken breast. Now, that isn't low calorie by any stretch of the imagination because there is that hot oil on mm -hmm. it. But it's it's I feel like it's it's doable and it is delicious. Yeah, and it, yeah, and it's it's easy, right? Mm -hmm. You could. Yeah. I mean, how long would a recipe like this take? I'm trying to quickly scan, like, call it under an hour. Under, right? under an hour so, for sure. Yeah. So Most of my recipes are yeah. about uh, 30, 45 minutes. So weeknight, easy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Especially in the summer. That's something you also have to take into consideration when you're putting recipes together. I would assume mm -hmm. also is. As you were saying, there's the time aspect of getting home and wanting to cook, keeping them while you got mm -hmm. them, I guess. But is there a sweet spot for the time that it takes for someone in your book specifically that should kind of be looked I, at? Or what do you, um, what do you I mean? don't have a hard number, you know, because some things obviously like a casserole might take 45 minutes or 60 minutes. You know, obviously some roasts are going to take 45 to 60 minutes. Um, I, I'm not all about quick, but I just try to be respectful of people's time mm -hmm. and like what people are going to do. And there is also reality, like I'm working on a project now um, for my meal kit line, and they want some 20 minute recipes. Mm. <laughs> it can 20, be done. <laughs> 20 minutes, and so, but you know, what? what You have to assume a lot about prep time. Yeah. When you're talking about, like, what, can I am, I'm actually went, curious uh? about what their guidelines are about. <laughs> you know, it's like, do you actually, actually estimate how long it's gonna take the average home cook to chop up an onion and a carrot and a piece of celery? And, right, you know, well like, that's my, right? yeah. It's like, it, Depend, you know, depending on their skill level, it could take 20 minutes to do all the prep work. <laughs> or you know distraction what I mean? or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. No, no, no. So I was like, 20 minutes? Because what I can do in 20 minutes and what, I mean, I, I chop onions for a living. Right. You know what I mean? I, I take a I, really long time. To, I'm so, bad at chopping onions. So, so. Um, so that's pretty significant. But, you know, um, every just because it's quick doesn't mean it's good. Right. Mm -hmm. Just because it's quick, um, you know, it's not always about being quick, right? You want to have something that's going to be satisfying and that you want to feed your family, that you want to eat, that you want, you know, all of those things. So It's approachable, yeah. I think, it's a, which yeah. is, you, yeah. you said, and we use that term a lot here when we're talking about our recipe right. testing and development, too, is let's make cooking and food approachable because we all have to eat. Exactly. So let's enjoy it and exactly. not make it crazy. No, and like the, the onion dip that we did last week, for example, um, uh, so it's baked caramelized mm -hmm. Vidalia onions. Now, the, the one that I talk about in the piece um, is, is like, uh, two cups of onion, three cups of cheese, and a cup of mayonnaise. Uh -huh. It's a fat bomb. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's a delicious fat bomb yeah. that everybody loves. Right. But it is a fat bomb. There's no <laughs> doubt about it. And that takes about, I think it's the r typical recipes take about 20 minutes, 25 right. minutes. Mm -hmm. So I sort of flipped it because um, the onions in, in my dip, which still has cheese and still has a, a lot of great flavor, but it, it is not a fat bomb. Um, it takes about 20 minutes in the pan but then it's just popped under the broiler for just a few minutes. So yeah. the time is spent, and there's a little bit more attention to it, mm -hmm. but it's it sort of evens out yeah. time-wise. It also looks amazing. If you haven't seen yeah. that recipe on southernkitchen.com, I just was looking at it yesterday and drooling a It's like bit. French onion. <laughs> it tastes like French, French onion soup. Yeah. It tastes like, you know, the French, the French yeah. onion soup. So there's looks nothing great. wrong with that. <laughs> Can you talk about what you have in front of us yes. right now? Yes. Yeah. So, so this is um, this is a butter, feta buttermilk. Um, dip. And you, you encourage mm -hmm. all to taste it if you'd like. So, yeah, go for it, Mike. Um, in the book, in Secrets of the Southern Table, I have it, but I uh, I serve it with roast beets and arugula, like a salad. But you could easily like sort of separate that out. Mm -hmm. And this is actually inspired by um, the Miller Miller Union feta snack mm -hmm. of Stephen Satterfield's mm -hmm. recipe, and he uses Decimal Place Farms, a local goat farm here. Um, and so that would be an example of like recipe development, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I've had that so many times at Miller Union 
love that dish. I love like the fresh vegetables and stuff with it. Um, but for the cookbook, I sort of did my version of the dip and then made it into a salad. But then today, we're just serving it with crudite. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so, uh, so it consists of feta and a really delicious buttermilk, um, garlic, mint, which I think is, is interesting because mm -hmm. mint people usually think about for dessert. Mm -hmm. It sweetens it up. Like uh, that. And, then, um, and then heartily seasons with salt and pepper. That's the, that's the part that I think is the, the kicker because the pepper especially because it offsets the saltiness of the feta. Yeah, I like the heartily. That's heartily. Like heartily, that. yeah. heartily. I'm all about I heartily. I think, I think it confuses people who are not super well versed in the kitchen when people say things like salt and pepper to taste. They're mm -hmm. like, I don't know, but right, you know, right. I think seasoning is really yep. Yep. important and I appreciate the heartily. No, for sure. And then um, <laughs> go, go for it. There <laughs> is, in the, in the cookbook I use um, olive oil, just a little bit of olive oil in there. And then today I brought, I brought this, it's a green peanut oil, I don't know if y'all have seen it or not, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's a wonderful, one of our wonderful southern products that we have. We actually sell um, Oliver Farms oil oh, on southernkitchen.com yep. oh, mm -hmm. too. We sell a Seriously, variety not, pack. That's awesome. Remember 20% off with MOM20, <laughs> uh -huh. Mom20 is the promo code, mm -hmm. site-wide sale. Get those peanut oil bottles for mom, she will be appreciative. <laughs> they also have a really amazing uh, pecan oil. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the sunflower oil, all, all of it. Benny yeah, seed too, right? Benny seed. Yeah, yeah. no, it's all, it's all delicious. So olive oil or something like that would be wonderful, but um, be, when you're able to find those little Georgia gems, yeah. you know, I think it's a good thing to do. Get those. Well, speaking of gems, I actually don't have a way to segue that, but I thought maybe <laughs> I could try it. But, by the way, are you signed up for our email list is the question, because if not, you should hit pause right now and head over to southernkitchen.com and sign up. You will get delicious tried and true recipes sent directly to your inbox, plus many special offers on products in the shop. And tried and true is something that uh, Virginia mm -hmm. Willis, we're just talking about this with recipe development. So um, you just mentioned that, you just mentioned our friend Stephen Satterfield from mm -hmm. here in Miller Union, another James Beard winner, mm -hmm. is that correct? So very cool guy. Uh, but let's talk about Steve. going and to places like that around the South and just in your journeys and experiences from restaurants to farms to everything. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, and, and I know that a big part of this book was you traveling for mm -hmm. eight months right. to get the stories for this book. So we'd love for you to talk about that. So um, much in the way that so the stories were chosen um, looking at different artisans and harvesters and farmers throughout the South. And I wanted to make sure to include a variety of people. Um, and so started off with uh, Will Harris from White Oak Pastors, of course. Um, I love Will, I love his family. And the other story is Matthew Rayford um, from Gilliard Farms down in Brunswick. So we started there, and I started there very intentionally because I wanted to start with um, those two farms White Oak Pastures was founded, as y'all probably know, um, when Will's ancestor came home from, from fighting for the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. And Matthew's family farm was founded when his ancestors was emancipated from slavery. So I just thought that was like editorially, contextually, content-wise, so cool. I just, I felt like that was the where the heart of the book needed to start. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and so I also wanted to, in this book, to to share the different, you know, all the different people. Um, and it's not enough to like just find a person, right? There has to be a story. It's like, it's not enough to um, like, oh, I need a fruit farmer or a female mm -hmm. fruit farmer. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, what, what about that, right? You know, right. What you do the, with your stories find in Southern story. Kitchen, we have to find a story. Right. So for example, um, Diane Flint is um, is my store is my female fruit farmer, <laughs> um, but I sort of I had I mapped it out. I really you know it's not it's very it's very thought through and it was very thought through and planned mm -hmm. to to be able to showcase different ethnicities, uh, a mixture of, of female and male of course, and then also a variety of ages. Mm -hmm. Like there's a story about the folks at Mini Fold Farm, and you know they're twenty something year old farmers. The average age of a farmer is 58, and it's usually a white, a white guy, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, not to discount those men. Will Harris is a 50-year-old year old white guy. I love Will Harris. I love that. But just to sort of like, well, you're going to expect this, so let's look at that, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. Um, and it, there's just so many, there's so many great characters and so many great um, stories in the South. Um, and, you know, just trying to explain to people what the South is, I think that, the folks outside of the South don't always understand it. 
they just don't get it. Yep. It's, food is a huge part of our culture. Um, we're an agricultural based society. You know, mm-hmm. there's just a, there's a lot there. Absolutely. What is your favorite story from uh, the book? I teed up that I was going to ask you Oh, man. (laughs) You didn't tell me that one. Um, I have to say that, answer your question, not answer your question, there were snippets from every story that really, like, went straight to my heart, Mm -hmm. went straight to the, the, like, the core of my being. You know, Matthew, for example, he was, like, the chef of the House of Representatives. I mean, that's that's high cotton, Mm -hmm. right? And he moved back to Brunswick, Georgia, to be a farmer and to open some restaurants. And, um, you know, it, it can be challenging being in South Georgia. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. South Georgia can be challenging. So I remember walking with him in the, um, in, on his property, and it was so beautiful. And the photographs that Angie took, I think, are just so evocative. But this Spanish moss and all this. And, you know, he was telling me this story about when he, um, when he was young, if anybody walked on the road, the man that owned the property would charge them a tax. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so that that wasn't a legal tax, right? Right. right. And so Matthew learned to walk in the woods. Um, and so, and I just kind of got, I was, I was paralyzed almost with the emotion that was coming out of him and me about what it was like to grow up as a, a black kid in Brunswick, Georgia. And I just was like, I literally remember stopping and being like, why'd you come back? Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, they, it's so powerful. Yeah. And what he's doing is why he came back. He's got this amazing farm. He's doing amazing food. When I was in his cafe, I'm not kidding you all. When I was in his cafe, there was a, this beautiful older matriarchal lady with pearls there was um, a woman a female rabbi from Brooklyn with her little girl Mm -hmm. that had moved there there was it was like this this the UN the UN was in that you know what I mean it was a little bit of everybody and that made me feel so good it made me feel so good for Matthew and the work that he and Jovan are doing it made me feel good for Brunswick, Georgia, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And it made me feel good for the South in general. It's hopeful. It's very hopeful. Yeah. So, so that was a really powerful story. Um, and you know, there's just there's there's a lot of good people doing a lot of really great food. Um, the sorghum farm in Tennessee, mm-hmm. you know, and, and just getting to see some of those um, things was really amazing. Yeah. One thing I really appreciated too is that you talk to farmers that were not necessarily small farms doing right. like all organic, like kind of the um, th- people you would expect to see at a small farmer's market. There, right, are, right, right. there are other people m- making food in the South and I appreciated that that was also in there. It wasn't like, oh, we just don't, we don't need to talk to them or whatever. No, you know? there is a sense of, I think, elitism, right? I mean, mm-hmm. you gotta have some money to pay eight ninety nine dollars a pound for t- heirloom tomatoes. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a, there's a um, so I do have Glenn Roberts with Anson Mills, mm-hmm. but there's also a story about a commodity rice farm and the Richard family rice farm in Louisiana. Um, uh, small boutique farms can't feed the nation. Right. right. Let's be real, yeah. right? But there's a place, so there, not yeah. but, and there's a place for both, right. right? So, yes, I love artisan oil, and yet we also have to recognize that, that um, you know, this is a, a precious product, mm-hmm. right? And that not everyone can afford it, um, and so it's just nice to look at those other stories. Mm-hmm. Good, and so thank you for recognizing that. Mm-hmm. And it also does seem um, when we were talking uh, not very long ago uh, over at uh, talking to Holly Shoot mm-hmm. and in the at Georgia know, Ground. Georgia Ground. Holly Shoot. Yeah, Holly <laughs> Shoot. She's uh, she's awesome. She made a biscuit. <laughs> oh, you would have liked. I, I'm sure you've had Holly Shoot. I biscuit, love Holly Shoot. Holly Shoot's yeah. awesome. But Holly was talking about to your point going around the south and especially Georgia which is what she's focused in on Georgia Brown. but those kind of products and they need their stories to be told right. and so who's coming down there and who's getting on the road to actually discover these places and maybe not discover in the sense of you are pioneering this brand but mm-hmm. how does the story get out there because there's not always just the I'm putting a seed in the ground and watching it grow but then how am I displaying this for the world to know about and how does the word spread so right. I'm sure that for you there's always a feeling that 
how do I kind of incorporate folks? And mm -hmm. you meet so many people on the road, but it's just how do you, how does it come down to who's doing things and how you help and how you not necessarily kind of get out of the way or, or what? How does that work? Well, you know, part of it is, and I keep m mentioning Will. He's definitely on my mind. Um, a business has to be sustainable. And in many levels, it doesn't matter if you're farming and raising carrots or whatever you're producing. Um, if the business end of it isn't sustainable, then it doesn't matter how delicious those tomatoes are. Right. Right. So part of it is there's some there's some folks doing really good work. Clamor Dave is in a story. He's in South Carolina. He's um, growing, uh, raising clams off the coast of Charleston. Mm. Um, they're delicious. Um, there's a eco ecological implications there. Their clams are uh, uh, feeder filters, um, filter feeders rather, um, and it, that is a sustainable seafood choice, which I'm really big into sustainable seafood and mm -hmm. like to promote. Um, but if he doesn't, if he can't sell his clams and no one knows about his clams, then that business isn't going to be sustainable, right? Right. So part of it is. Um, the, the shining a light on people like, hey, look at this, and, or hey, taste this. Um, and, you know, the, conversely, the commodity rice family, the Richard mm -hmm. family, um, hey, look at them too, mm -hmm. right? They've been farming rice for five generations. Right. That's mm -hmm. significant. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a big part of the South and what rice means in the South. And, um, you know, it, it, it just, it has, a, it has further implications in your plate. Well, let's also talk about when these folks do become successful and they find their way into some great southern restaurants. Where mm -hmm. have you eaten around the South that you thought, oh my goodness, people need to be coming in here and you know, ex and, and experiencing what you read? Because I'm always interested in what the chefs and the folks who are on the ground, right. where they go, what do they eat, what do they like? Well, I love to, I mean, I, I love to travel and I, lo I am fortunate in that I get to travel different places. I always just try to figure out where the locals go and I don't mm -hmm. care if I'm in Mobile, Alabama, or Rome, Italy, right? I just want to figure out where the locals go mm -hmm. and what they're eating. I thought you were going to say Rome, Georgia. Rome, Georgia. <laughs> uh, that would have been, been smarter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, that is a, that's a sadness, right? I mean, that is one thing that we recognize. Like, it doesn't matter what exit you're at. If you're in Alabama or Georgia or North Carolina, a lot of those interstate exits look alike. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, But I have hope. There are small mom-and-pop restaurants that have thrived and are still alive. There are chefs and cooks, um, you know, like uh, Cody and Gian Lee with Heirloom Barbecue. You know, they're both mm -hmm. trained white tablecloth, fancy chefs mm -hmm. that open a barbecue restaurant that is killing it. Damn good yes. barbecue. It's it killing it, <laughs> it's so right? Yep. So they're, you know, it's just like um, open your eyes, look around kind of see what's going on. Yeah. Um, there's some good people doing good food. It kind of feels like, too, we've talked about this with some of our southern cities that a lot of smaller places around the south, outside of the big cities, right. are, are really flourishing with their culinary scene, too. It's, it's, ex it's expensive to open a restaurant, right? right? And with the economy the past couple of years, a lot of people are, are going for more smaller outlets, which is a more sustainable business practice, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. And you're definitely seeing it. Um, Let's talk about Kohler again, just to make sure everyone knows that at Kohler, you will find the super stylish Monte Carlo Round Bar Sink by Callista, which features reflective hand-hammered finish accents and copper construction for reliability and durability. Kohler, we gotta love it. Now, um, we wanna also ask you, segueing from that last bit about mm -hmm. eating around the South, what do you think is right now, you know, like in the kitchenary sense, what's hot? And, you know, what do you think is coming next? As you're putting these books together, I'm sure this isn't going to be the last book that we see from right. Virginia Willis. So <laughs> God I'm, willing, yeah. That's right. <laughs> but I'm sure you'll edit the obituary. <laughs> you know, so, but oh, <laughs> she'll be back, folks. <laughs> but what do you see kind of like in these travels? And we talked about, you know, getting the stories that are out there now. But what's developing and what's, what's out there right now? Well, I think that if we look right now, like the cookbooks that have come out, that I'm so excited about uh, Todd Richards' book, Soul. Yes. That's awesome. Eddie Hernandez's book, uh, ta 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 sorry, Taco Turner Green. Green. Ta ta tacos yep. and Turner Greens. Yep. Um, that's an awesome book. And the, the, the thing that I think is so exciting about that, so my book, my book is about a diversity of people, a diversity of recipes, you know, um, and, I, and what excites me is that, so here we have Todd, with his take on Southern food. And then we have Eddie with his take on Southern food. So really, 
we're all kind of saying the same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Southern food just isn't like chicken and biscuits. Now, I love a chicken and biscuit, right? But there's more to it than that. You know, Todd's background, he is, is a fine dining chef, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and Eddie, he's like created this like awesome mashup of what Southern food is. And, and, um, and so I think that what's next in terms of Southern food is realizing that Southern food is a living, breathing, growing, changing thing, that, that we can have our historical, traditional recipes. Which and people love. Which people you know? love. Yeah. But you know, we, we have the internet. <laughs> right. <laughs> and we have excessive, you know, like here in Atlanta, Buford Highway. Oh, yes. You know, we yeah. have, there's a recipe in the book for an Asian Cajun shrimp, and I saw mm -hmm. like oh, last night on Instagram, there's an Asian Cajun crawfish place here in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think that what's next is like celebrating some of those different cultures that are in the South. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we talk about the classics and, and mashups and spins, you know, one of the things that I love about the work that you do and that we try to do here is is taking some of those, classi those classics mm -hmm. and figuring out how to mash them up and make them different right. like your grilled gumbo for example right. mm -hmm. totally different spin on gumbo right. which is a you know classic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. creole new orleans food mm -hmm. thank you i love that recipe yeah, yeah. i mean it, it it's just um we have such great ingredients in the south and there are a lot there's just so many different um ways to look at it you know there's other ways to do okra we don't always have to I love fried okra we don't always have to fry okra right mm -hmm. we can grill it or like what's on the cover it's like an Indian inspired um, dipping sauce that goes with it um, you love okra more than I, I yeah. think anyone <laughs> okay. all right look at this oh you know, the yes. okra's on the necklace uh -huh. I yeah. love the okra and, and even yeah. when you cut it that long sideways mm -hmm. it's just like so pretty so it just seems like a design that can like kind of you could fall into that rabbit yeah. hole and start being inspired no, no, do you no, have I, a dried okra around your house of course yeah <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a little I am a little probably okra for that <laughs> <laughs> I mean, now that I think about it but you know it, you know it's, I'm not, it's, it's one of those vegetables that people love or hate I'm clearly we all know yeah. what side I'm on but I always call myself like an okra apostle. I'm just trying to get people to try it grilled, try it some other yes. way. Step outside of the Step fried outside okra. And fried so or, um, okra's kind of next then. You, you're feeling like there's going to be an okra, uh, okra renaissance? Not okra. <laughs> we almost, I almost yeah, did it. There you did. <laughs> okra renaissance. Yeah. Do, you think it's, do you think people are going to do way more? Obviously, you've know. written stuff. Yeah, no, I, I think so. Yeah, I think yeah. so. I hope so. Okay. What? Taipani's opening up a lot of eyes to okra. It's I have Indian. a lot of family members that... that hated okra and they go there and they eat that okra and they're like oh this is delicious I'm like I told you no I know see it's like it's mm -hmm. what's cool I think and what I think I've executed in this book is looking at southern ingredients in someone else's skillet uh. right like yeah. you know um, I spoke with Besh and he was like oh Besh um, at in from Mississippi and um, he uh Vish sorry and um he um you know, it's a very Indian vegetable, yeah. right? And okra grows where it's hot. Right. Mm -hmm. It's hot in India. Yes. You know, it's hot in and, the south. Uh, and it's hot in the south. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it's, it's a, they use it a lot in Brazil and stuff. So, you know, it's just like looking at what we consider to be this like very distinctly southern thing in another skillet. I love that. Mm -hmm. What is there a particular, you know, I feel like everything's kind of had its moment, right? Nashville is... Mm -hmm. I think we're like kind of seeing the tail end of like once uh -huh. like McDonald's or whoever it was or KFC, fast, KFC yeah, jumped yeah, once a fast food chicken. kind of right. jumps on the back and you're like all right that's how what's like what dish or particular ingredient or vegetable or like what's what's trending right now do you think hmm well I think I actually had planning a menu for an event that I'm doing in New York and I wanted to do shrimp and grits and I was like do I yeah. want to do shrimp and mm -hmm. grits you know, because then, then I sort of Googled it a little bit, because shrimp and grits, I think that, like, literally Crystal had shrimp Everybody's and grits. Everybody's got it. Yeah. That's yeah. okay. You know? yeah. Yeah. Um, but I Googled New York City, and it's like, where to find the, you know, Google about shrimp and grits in New York, and it's still... They want to know about this thing. Yeah, to, yeah. Them, to them, this is like, grits how does this even work? Yeah. Yeah. To yeah. people. Yeah. No, and, people, yeah. yeah. So I think I think that what's, what's, going, what's happening and what's so exciting and what is trending or will become trending is cool ingredients. Right, mm -hmm. like we're digging a little bit yeah. deeper on heirloom products, on you know the work that David Shields mm -hmm. does, um, you know the, the Southern Kitchen, and so we're we're looking past that sort of uh, um, commodity tomato or mm -hmm. to an heirloom tomato, or looking what what like what Glenn is doing with some of the grains and things like that. Mm -hmm. like, 
they taste different. I mean, agriculture right. changed tremendously after World War II, and so we're going back to some of those older things. Wild yeah. mushrooms and yeah, things. Yeah, foraging, deep diving, getting more in touch with our food, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now it's my favorite part of the show. Oh, yes. Which I yes. did prepare you for. <laughs> <laughs> it's the bless your heart moment. Yes, yes. If you got if you don't have I'm going to I'm going to bless my own heart okay, for a second okay. because I'm going to fangirl and ask you to sign my pen. Oh, okay. Bless. So bless my heart. heart. Bless you have the right kind of pen. Yeah, oh, you're ready. Don't tip on it. That's you're ready. outstanding. So you can um, bless my heart. Bless your heart, Ashley Twist Cole, for <laughs> using the video and the pressure that she couldn't leave and That's had right. to sign it right here That's on right. Facebook Live and uh -huh. Ashley That's awesome. Um, so what if you if you had to think of something that if it's you know lovingly lighthearted fun, but what's a bless your heart moment? Is it these New Yorkers who are just now learning what a grit is? Is it you know these folks who are thinking that Southern food can only be unhealthy? Uh, what what is who gets a bless your heart? I from think that that might choice? that might do it. Uh, th those folks might do it because I, I literally and I talk about it in the introduction. Mm -hmm. I had someone in Kansas City ask me if I'd ever met a Jewish person before. <laughs> Not Bless making, not making that, that up. Yeah. Like, gentleman or woman's yeah, heart. Yeah. Like, did you see driving Miss Daisy? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, did you? Were you paying attention at all? A lot of people were. Yeah, people weren't. So, um, so, so, so that that definitely the, the people that that, uh, that those folks that don't think that we are a literate cultured, educated South, they all get a bless they your heart. They all get a bless your heart. That's a good right. one. Yeah. Bless your heart yeah. out bless there. Please don't think that we yeah. can write and read and eat good food. <laughs> That's exactly right. All right. Well, we, I believe, have a couple of questions from our live audience out there on Facebook. Uh, Producer Ramona, uh, who who's out there and asking questions? Mm -hmm. um, someone asked, what is your favorite photograph in the book? What is your favorite photograph oh. in the book? It's a great, it's a tough question. Yep, They're all yep, beautiful. Yep. I know, I know, I have it. She's got it. I have it automatically. I think that this is one of the most beautiful photographs I've ever seen. Ooh. So this is um, uh, Richard Farms, and this is the rice farm in, in southern Louisiana. And I just think that that, um, that farmer, that's um, his I mean, expression. He's, just everything about it, like, you know, it's peak harvest. Yep. He's got this crazy cookbook author mm -hmm. and her photographer. <laughs> and and um, you what's know, the photographer's name again? Angie Moser. Angie She's Moser, one. So Angie Moser. She's Angie. one of my favorite people on the planet. And that picture, there's a guy. He's got on a brimmed hat. He's got his fist on his cheek. He's mm -hmm. leaning on the edge we of the door, looking yeah, out into yeah. some grains or some. Uh, fields of just crops and it's just it's it's wistful. You see a truck moving around yep. there and doing stuff. Sorry. Grains, grits, and other starchy goodness. So he's watching his harvest, and and um, you know, I mean, that's that's it. Like that's his life. That's his livelihood. That's yep. five, six mm -hmm. generations of farming. Um, I mean, I just think that's a super powerful photograph. Um, and one of the things that we're doing, um, Angie and I have done, is that we have printed and mounted and framed a collection of photographs from oh, cool. the book. Oh, wow. And I'm going to have it at the um, launch party at the History Center on um, Monday. And then later in the, the summer, um, for, uh, for Art Month in Decatur, Georgia, mm -hmm. um, we're going to, there's going to be an exhibit, they're going to be exhibited oh, cool. and they'll be up for two weeks. Um, because it's, it's not just the, you know, it's not just the food pictures, right? It's like the travel, it's the eight months of travel to 11 states mm -hmm. um, and so um, you know the food pictures are good there's no doubt about it but mm -hmm. getting to meet and to see just the the geography was amazing the people out there absolutely yeah. remember folks uh, mom 20 mom 20 you can get 20% off site-wide at southernkitchen.com shop and that does include pre-ordering Secrets of the <laughs> Southern Table by Virginia Willis you better get your copy of that book now and one more question I think. Um, how does this cookbook stand out from your other wonderful cookbooks? You sort of answered this. Yeah, no. Um, well, I'm glad. Thank, thank you for people thinking that they're wonderful. Uh, the, the, this was a big departure for me because of the stories. So mm -hmm. I, I feel like um, you know it's not just about me. It's about other people and um, and just uh, trying to tell little vignettes of them um, and intertwine it with the recipes. Yeah, I love it. Pick up the book, folks, and uh, that I'm going to pick mine up in a nice. Yeah, 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 I know yeah, you yeah. already got Two one. Side side. Copy. Thank, Thank you, man. Yes, man. <laughs>
That will do it for us this week at Sunday Supper. We'd love to hear from you. You can always reach out to us with feedback at editor at southernkitchen.com. Also, please subscribe at Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And please hit those like buttons to keep up with us on Facebook. Until next time, I'm Mike Jordan. I'm Kate Williams. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ashley Twist Cole. And I'm Virginia Willis. That's right. And uh, I don't really have anything to close this one out except <laughs> y'all. So bon appetit, sure y'all. Remember to say bon appetit, y'all, bon when you're appetit, eating the salad. Thanks again, folks. Thank you.